welcome to the monthly temple meeting of Sri Lanka Association of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Today, the temple meeting is conducted in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Transfusion Divisions. Uh, transfusion, as you know, is a common clinical scenario we encounter daily, but this is something that we don't much talk about. So, as clinicians, sometimes when we see the patient who need transfusion, we have a low threshold to proceed to transfusion. But do we really need? So, today there are three eminent speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Trisha Vipanasam. She will be talking to us on why we give blood when we can do without it. Dr. Trisha Vipanasam is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine. University of uh, St. John for the Lauder Defense University. Uh, over to tradition. Good afternoon. Uh, today's topic is why we give blood when we can do without it. Red cell concentrates contributes highest number of transfusions worldwide. It's due to treating the anemic patients. Significance of anemia in worldwide because it's a major problem worldwide where we have found out more than 2.9 billion world population suffering from this condition. Mainly preoperatively, most patients going for the surgical procedure, nearly more than 75% of the belly, they are anemic. And post-operatively, due to many reasons, probably due to bleeding or other complications, they would be anemic. And nutritional deficiencies, mainly iron deficiency, we can see. And anemia due to non-communicable diseases and other hematological conditions as well as the malignant conditions and many infectious diseases and mainly hospital acquired anemia also significantly associated. It could be due to the iatrogenic blood loss. They say in one study, 35% and another study, up to 74% of the patient hospital acquired anemia due to antigenic blood loss. And one study says stay in ICU. If a patient stays more than seven days, there's a prevalence of anemia nearly 100%. So it is a major problem in hospital settings. In our country, WHO figures say prevalence of anemia in Sri Lanka is about 29%. So if we just go through the surgical procedures and anemia, how is the relevance? Uh, we, we have seen more than 310 million of surgical procedures worldwide, where preoperatively up to uh, nearly 50% of the procedures, uh, we have anemic patients going for the surgery. And post-operatively, 80 to 90 percent uh, of the post-surgical procedure people are anemic. So, in elective procedures like major orthopedic procedures, hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, nearly 25 percent of patients undergo anemia. Where we are going to highlight this: how is anemia? contributes to the uh, perioperative transfusion ultimately because of anemic patients are going for the elective procedures. Preoperative anemia and postoperative outcomes has been analyzed in non-cardiac surgical procedures. In over 2 million patients, preoperative anemia even to a milder degree is independently associated with an increased risk of 30-day morbidity and mortality in patients undergoing the major non-cardiac surgeries. In the meta-analysis of the association between the preoperative anemia and mortality after surgery, they have studied 24 uh, studies and anemia was significantly associated with the increased risk of perioperative mortality, acute kidney injuries, infection, stroke in cardiac surgeries, and most of these are ultimately ended up with cell transfusions also. 
So now we know how anemia and surgical surgery is uh, their relationship and how it contributes to associate with transfusion. Perioperative anemia and risk of transfusion. Association of anemia, comorbidities, and red cell transfusion according to the age groups they have analyzed. And here you can see how much uh, red cell transfusion with the preoperative anemia and without preoperative anemia. In orange bars, you can see without preoperative anemia, transfusion thresholds are very much low when compared with the anemia, they may receive transfusions. Preoperative anemia versus blood transfusion. Uh, this study they have analyzed the, which is the culprit for worse outcome in cardiac procedures. They ultimately concluded that red cell transfusion appears more strongly uh, associated with the risk adjusted morbidity and mortality compared with the preoperative hematopoietic level alone. That means because of the anemia is more than the anemia, the outcome is worse with the transfusions. So anemia is a major predictor of the administration of perioperative allogenic blood transfusion. So long-term survival of perioperative transfusion versus non-transfused patients. Now we are keen on giving blood to correct anemia. So they have analyzed over three-year period of how is the survival with anemia. So here uh, the dash line is uh, for the uh, non uh, perioperative anemia, where uh, dash line is for the perioperative transfusion, where uh, no anemia in the lighter uh, dash line, and uh, yellowish dash line is the mild anemia and severe anemia. In all three kinds of anemic patients, where if they have receiving transfusion, so it's worse in outcome than the uh, non transfusion receiving uh, anemic patients and no non anemic patients. So here, intraoperative transfusions and mortality and morbidity undergoing non-cardiac procedures. So the complications they have analyzed pulmonary, septic wounds, infections, and the thromboembolic infections. So here, the red bars transfusion group compared with the non-transfusion group in uh, blue bars. Here, the, all the infection rates are higher among when they have received the transfusion. More the transfusion, more the complications. So you can understand here, so now anemia uh, due to various reasons, one thing is the coagulopathy due to surgical procedures, other thing is the blood loss can cause anemia. Ultimately, all these contribution to the uh, association of the transfusion. So this is a triad of the independent risk factor for the adverse outcome. Here in this study, they have uh, clearly um, understand it as a vicious cycle in a surgical procedure. So anemia is a major predictor of the administration of allogenic blood and transfusion is an independent risk factor for morbidity and mortality in the surgical patients. So this is a very important study in Austria. They have done the main benchmark study on blood use in the elective surgical procedures. So where they have found out 97.4 all transfusions have been predicted by the level of anemia, perioperative blood loss, and the transfusion trigger. So all these are modifiable risk factors. So if we consider the correction things, first thing must be first. So before surgery, if perioperative anemia uh, and in the elective procedures, we can prevent. These are preventable conditions. If we know the patient is going for an elective plan procedure, we have to see the patient in advance and then we have all sorts of methodologies to correct, identify, and to avoid transfusion. And if we treat the nutritional deficiencies and if we identify the micronutrients, and anemia is a very common iron deficiency, it's a very common condition in worldwide, by that we can prevent transfusion. And identifying the coagulopathy conditions and underlying diseases, we can help prevent transfusion. So, uh, though we have we know the these uh, scenarios and understand this, but we have obstacles. So, beliefs and practices actually common everywhere in the country, uh, worldwide as well. So, I took this from our neighbor country from one presenter. So, it, they say who is accountable on our transfusion and who carries the responsibility. Actually, still uh, sometimes uh, it is not accountable as such. 
and uh, most of our patients are being managed by single specialty. So we are the multiple specialists available if we can encounter getting help from the other colleagues also we can get opinions in different ways and to reduce blood transfusion. And early decision on transfusion, uh, most of the time because of the fear or uh, some kind of wrong uh, uh, predictions, we may go for the early decisions. And formula-based transfusion. Most of the time, we do see in our practice, still practice, if it is red cell, give two units, kind of, uh, those are formula-based, without assessing the patient individual requirement and the individual assessment according to the patient, to patient, those are very much varied. And the requirement versus the availability. So our availability is free healthcare, free availability of blood. So we are more uh, availability, sometimes more used because easy accessibility is available in our country, especially. And correction of numbers. This is actually we must understand correction of numbers in the sense that report. Report comes from a laboratory. So we have to understand what is this report and what is the patient's underlying pathology and what numbers we have sent to this machine. Actually, if we all without not thinking about all these things, we just try to correct this report to make us happy, ultimately patient getting the worst outcome. And precautionary transfusions, as I mentioned earlier, always. Prophylactically, people, uh, clinicians tend to give blood without thinking that how much of it impact on the patient. And uh, we use the poor predictors of bleeding as well. So these are actually old habits. Those are die hard, but we can change the practice if we work as a team or group. So why this transfusion need to be restricted? It's mainly the morbidity and mortality. We saw this uh, child of cycle, which is cycle, ultimately this much of million units we give to blood uh, component worldwide. So where we identify from our undergraduate um, uh, level as well, where there are deterministic transfusion risks. We need to identify risks are there, where ABO incompatibility is a risk. And then acute hemolytic problems, we can see due to so many causes and other alloimmunizations and uh, transmission related acute lung, lung injuries and overloading conditions and immune modulations uh, and microchimerism kind of things we have been already known in our practice. But there are newly recognized medical legal implications. So these are probabilistic transmission risks. In one study, they have identified that uh, cancer recurrence and the hospital acquired infections are high, multi organ failure, sorry, acute kidney injuries, and the increased stay in the ICU and ultimately hospital stay also contribute to because of the transfusion. So, why is transfusion to be restricted? Uh, this adverse events, we know the adverse event, not only the adverse events, we have to um, collectively work on management of the adverse event. So there are additional resources, human resources, and all, always uh, we must uh, remember that intensive care facility is such an expensive facility that we must um, uh, take care of when we are admitting patients to those facilities. And the, ultimately the cost. Actually costing in our country, still we haven't done the exact costing for one unit of transfusion in our country. So various other countries, they have done Transfusion. UK is also a free health system, uh, but uh, they are the first must pay for the uh, blood service and the BT for the one unit approximately this much in 2021-2022. Actually, this costing must uh, include the management of the possible transfusion adverse events as well. Not only the blood procurement, though they are voluntary uh, blood collection. Most of the countries, including ours, is hundred percent. But all these uh, expensive to maintain of, of the infrastructure and all the reagents and the testing procedures. So how this problem be assessed? So no, we know we have a trial of uh, these things: anemia, blood loss, coagulopathy, ultimately leading to transfusion. So they have this done one study and they have identified three pillars. The pillar one. Uh, is the augmentation or endogenous uh, increase of the preoperative red cell mark where we can target on correction of anemia. Then the pillar two is the reduction of the surgical blood loss and bleeding. Blood loss, coagulopathy, we can, we can manipulate and we can monitor the patient, we can anticipate and we can treat them without going ahead for the more blood uh, loss. And the 
pilatris acceptance of the low hemoglobin threshold where we can produce the transfusion if we can just understand the patient's individual requirement rather uh, having our just traditional practices so the concept of patient blood management in 2007 in australia, australia they have just done a study and uh, understand these three pillars and they came out to WHO in 2010, declared that as a policy brief, this is an urgent matter to all over the world. So it is a patient-centered, systematic, evidence-based approach to patient outcome by managing patients' own blood to diagnosis and etiology specific treatment of anemia and preserving the patient's own blood blood by minimizing blood loss and bleeding while promoting patient safety and empowerment. All these are easy things. If we understand, if we can work together, we can achieve this good patient outcome. So if, we, if I do in detail, so these are the three pillars. The first pillar, this is mainly for the surgical, planned surgical procedures to optimize the erythropoiesis. We can do so many things preoperatively to detect anemia, to treat anemia, to identify the coagulopathy conditions, primary disease conditions where the patients are, uh, we have to treat and we have to refer them for the special management care. And intraoperatively to improve the red cell mass, we can do so many things. And postoperatively also we can improve the red cell mass. Uh, so there are different, different mechanisms actually without just leading to a transfusion, we can improve patient's own red cell mass without uh, any other manipulations. So, uh, second pillar is the minimize the blood loss and bleeding. Preoperatively, we can identify the bleeding risk and risky patient by simply taking family history and the past surgical history and any challenges he has exposed uh, in the past for the surgery flight. And intraoperatively, we know we are very good uh, technology and medicular surgical techniques, anesthesia techniques we do have, so we can improve our techniques during the operation. And post-operatively also, if we can do the vigilant management and avoid secondary hemorrhages, secondary bleeding conditions, and so many other things, and including there are uh, mechanisms to salvage the patient's own blood, though it is not available in our uh, other con our country in other countries they salvage all uh, lost blood and then they recover and again re infuse to the patient because they want to reduce the allogenic blood exposure where all these problems due to the other blood coming to the patient's pain. So the third pillar would be to uh, optimize the physiological reserve. Preoperatively we can assess as I mentioned earlier Intraoperatively also, we can optimize the cardiac output, we can optimize the ventilation and oxygenation and restrict the transfusion threshold. And postoperatively also, if we can minimize the infection, if we can optimize the anemia reserve and so many other things, we can prevent transfusion. So uh, in this uh, Axel Hoffman, they have identified is one of the uh, great personalities who is uh, worldwide talking about this topic. The clinician normally starts the question with how low can I go before administering a transfusion? So he considered it as a wrong because you also can understand. We all are just now focusing on the hematocrit. That's a lab report and the product is waiting and we all focus on which product, what to give, when to give like that. So it's a lab result given monotherapy regardless of the underlying cause, underlying patient identification and the disease. Ultimately, this is the leading factor for the transfusion. Instead of that, uh, he, he says, so this is what uh, that we have to go for. What can I do to minimize or eliminate the underlying causes of anemia and blood loss to improve patient outcomes? Even for patients not at risk for transfusion, where we can avoid transfusions. So we have a lot of opportunities. We don't need to miss our opportunities. So here, if we see this first pillar, the detection of anemia, if we miss preoperative assessment, if we don't do any correction, that is, we have missed opportunity. And then we come to the second pillar, that means the minimize the loss and the optimize the coagulopathy. So we have a lot of opportunities to correct anemia, permissive surgical blood loss, excessive hydrogenic blood loss, undetected disease conditions, and poorly managed coagulopathy. All these are we have missed opportunities. So we are we may lead to transfusion. Then the third pillar is the physiological tolerance of the anemia, and there could be 
ignorance, negligence, and fear as well. So behavior-based transfusion practices where we may go uh, increase transfusion uh, rather than restriction transfusion. So why we give blood when we can do without it? So we have done so many talks on this. So there are evidence-based practices available. No or minimal bleeding on non-anemic patients undergoing surgeries. So we have to correct anemia so where they won't, they won't be bleeding. So anemia and coagulopathy can be corrected before elective procedures to minimize bleeding and transfusions. Transfusion can be withhold if intraoperative blood conservation is performed. And postoperatively, we can avoid by managing the infections properly, minimizing nitrogenic blood loss is very important in our setup in ICU. So we know how much of uh, samples we do take routinely. And the good nutritional support and accepting lower thresholds of transfusion considered in the individual patients. So if there's an actual indication for transfusion, there's nothing like we don't uh, avoid transfusion as, as it is, because if there's an indicated patient, we can do transfusion. So if we, if we can reduce transfusion to one unit and do the correct assessment post transfusion, that would minimize another unit of transfusion. And always the restrictive protocols are better than liberal protocols. We may see some evidences uh, in later of the presentation. It's like this, there's a uh, Cochrane systematic review they have done on the transfusion threshold. They have taken uh, lower threshold as the 7, 8, and the liberal transfusion threshold, normally we go for uh, 9, 10, like that. In all these uh, surgical procedures to cover all the surgical procedures. So they have analyzed how is this restrictive transfusion versus liberal transfusion. So they have identified Restrictive transfusion did not cause any increase or decrease of the 30-day mortality or any other time mortality, cardiac events, myocardial infarction, stroke, pneumonia, thromboembolism, or infection. These are the common uh, critical conditions we do see in our setup. So we are, there's no difference in between liberal and uh, restrictive transfusion group. So another one, hip surgeries, we are liberal and restrictive transfusions in this study. They have analyzed liberal transfusion strategy as compared with the restrictive strategy did not reduce the death or inability to walk independently in 60-day follow-up or reduce in hospital mobility in elderly patients at high cardiovascular risk. So in this study, rate of major adverse cardiovascular events in a, uh, event in a restrictive versus liberal transfusion regimes in acute myocardial infarctions with anemia. Here you can see the restrictive transfusion uh, group has better doing than the liberal transfusion group. So for this one, actually, we all are stakeholders. You may identify yourself in this. This is from the WHO, uh, this uh, one guideline. So here we all must contribute and we all must work together to improve this. So I may end this. I prescribe regimes for the good of my pa patients according to my ability and my judgment and never do harm to anyone. That is our uh, oath and then uh, that's what uh, we are looking for and uh, we do all expect and uh, our job is like that. So I must thank all of you. Actually, alone, we can do so little. So together, we can do so much. That is from the Helen Keeler. Thank you very much. My colleague will uh, do the test of the things on the transfusion reaction and the preventable transfusion reaction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felicia, for that very informative presentation, enlightening us on the tips and then on the transfers. Let's say we move on to the second speaker. The second topic is transfusion related adverse events. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Nilanta Yenge. Uh, this is a transfusion medicine, a skin consultant, transfusion physician, working as a patient, a civil family. Over to you, Dr. Nilanta. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'll be talking about the uh, transmission-related uh, adverse events. A uh, few uh, key points, actually. So uh, what are our transmission relation and uh, related adverse events? So any adverse or uh, unwanted outcome of, an, uh, of a transmission of blood or blood components is considered as uh, unwanted uh, adverse reaction of uh, transmission reaction. So uh, most of the uh, transfusion, transfusions are uh, uneventful. 
and 10% of these uh, transfusion recipients will uh, have may have uh, encountered with uh, certain adverse events majority of them are uneventful and also uh, they are not uh, noticeable so uh, these uh, adverse events usually uh, present in uh, during the transfusion and after the transfusion also it might come in uh, later in uh, years so depending on the temporal nature we divide these uh, transfusion reactions into acute and delayed uh, transfusions so if the transfusion reaction is uh, occurring uh, within 24 hours or during the transfusions then we call it acute transfusion reactions if uh, it is more than after the uh, after 24 hours then it will be uh, it will called as delayed transfusion reactions so uh, based on the mechanism uh, we uh, subdivide these uh, transfusion reactions into immunological and non-immunological non reactions. So, uh, as you can see in the screen, uh, there are a few uh, reactions that to be noted. So, uh, acute immunological reactions that we mainly focus on the acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. So, for example, ABO incompatibility and then febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions, allergy reactions or anaphylaxis transfusion related acute lung injury. When it comes to non-immunological acu uh, acute transfusion reaction, bacterial contamination is a severe reaction, cardiac overload, and uh, some uh, physical and chemical hemolysis. So when it comes to delayed hemolytic, uh, hem uh, delayed immunological transfusion reactions, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, transfusion associated garbage hostesis, and post-transfusion purpura are the main adverse reactions and also non-immunological transfusion uh, reactions which are in delayed uh, category are the transfusion related hemosideresis in simple terms that's uh, the iron overload which comes in the thalassemic patients and regularly transfused patient mainly and uh, then the uh, transfusion transmitted infections sri lanka actually we encountered a lot of uh, hepatitis b uh, patients but it, it is coming down so that's why we have the screening when we do the donor uh, collections. So uh, I'll briefly explain about the uh, immunological transfusion reactions. So immunological transfusion reactions are the ones which uh, happens be, uh, because of the interaction between the recipients inherited or acquired antibodies with the relevant antigens of the donor's humoral or cellular components. So what is cellular components? The uh, red cells, WBCs and platelets. And the humoral components, of course, the antibodies against uh, the plasma proteins, which will in, uh, end up with the allergies or anaphylaxis. And uh, in other, uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, antibodies which can be present in the donor plasma and come to the recipient and do the reaction. So that is passively transfused antibodies. So that is in case of, uh, in case of uh, transfusion related acute lung injury. Of course, you can see that. So. Uh, so this is a, a diagram of a, a simple diagram of acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So I'll be talking about the acute and the delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions together, uh, so that uh, we can understand better. So when we transfuse any uh, red cells, if the 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 particular red cell is uh, having any antigens which are uh, not uh, compatible with the recipient, which means either it can be a ABO incompatibility or maybe the, the, the recipient has already produced uh, an antibody because of the previous exposure. So the antigen and antibody complex is there, so resulting in the hemolysis. So uh, when it comes to immune hemolytic uh, transmission reactions, what happens is here that uh, accelerated destruction occurs with the incompatible red cells. So uh, there are a few theories actually. So uh, the, this uh, doesn't come into uh, play in uh, every situation, but what happens here is uh, basically uh, as the first step, there should be an antigen and antibody complex uh, activation. So they get together and do the rest of the things. So it depends on the antibody, whether it is IgM, IgG, or maybe the dose, or maybe the depending on the patient. So in, in cases uh, where you have certain certain uh, uh, varieties you will end up with the, the different results so uh, certain antibody and antigen uh, complexes will end up with the activating complement systems whereas other things uh, might activate the cellular components as well so 
First thing is antigen antibody complex formation. Then opsonized red cells might interact with uh, the phagocytes and then they, they, they can activate the phagocytes. So the third part, so whatever the things that happens, the inflammatory medias, mediators will act on various cells causing the cell clinical manifestation. So that is the uh, place where we can uh, interrupt and we can know what is happening. So acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, it can be uh, either uh, uh, immunological or non-immunological. So immunological, the main cause is the ABO incompatibility. What are the non-immunological causes for uh, uh, acute hemolytic transfusion reactions? Mainly the chemical and the physiological, physical uh, damage to these uh, red cells. So uh, if you uh, see this uh, slide, uh, there are some causes especially uh, accidental freezing or heating. Right? There are certain practices in, uh, in uh, previous decades. So, uh, so it is not, uh, not uh, common these days. And sometimes uh, if the red cells are, uh, uh, get contaminated with water or uh, like 5% uh, red source, of course, the red cells will lyse. So you will end up with uh, acute hemolytic transfusion reactions and also bacterial contamination, very important. And I also... Uh, if the administration is uh, occurred through a small gauge a needle, or maybe if you squeeze to uh, send the blood uh, to the patient in a in a fast manner, then uh, you will end up with physical damage. So, so whatever the cause, whatever whatever the mechanism, the cell lysis will end up with acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So uh, ABO incompatibility. Why we talk about this? Uh, because it is very significant and very severe immunological reaction. So this is basically because of the ABO incompatibility between the donor and the recipient. So the antibodies here are the uh, IgM form, and those are naturally occurring. And uh, this IgM form is very competent enough to uh, go and activate the complement system, where you can activate the C1Q, and in, uh, in uh, terms to come, uh, come uh, C3, they activate the C3 level, and CA will be released. And, C3B will uh, activate, uh, adhere to the red cells and it will activate the C5. And uh, finally, the membrane attacking complex goes in the intravascular hemolysis. So the difference between the acute hemolytic transfusion reaction is uh, the intravascular hemolysis versus the extravascular hemolysis. So uh, causes for this ABO incompatibility mean uh, mainly because of the clerical errors and the techni technical errors. So either you uh, uh, fail to identify the correct patient, or maybe the wrong pack will go to the wrong patient. And the technical errors are the uh, ones which uh, happens in the blood bank level. So uh, this uh, the the picture will uh, summarize the uh, the pathophysiology. So uh, what happens here is the donor red cell and the recipient's antibody will interact with each other. So the complement activation is there. So I'll go to the hemolysis first. So the complement activation will end up in the, activating the C9 level and it will uh, uh, form the membrane attacking complex, causing the patching the uh, uh, red cells, causing the intracellular compartment will, uh, the, the things will come out into the extravascular, com uh, extracellular compartment. So the hemoglobin will uh, release into the blood and there'll be hemoglobin, hemoglobin urea. So uh, this is uh, uh, the haptoglobulin, that uh, haptoglobin will naturally uh, bind with the hemoglobin. So uh, ultimately result in the low haptoglobin in the uh, circulation. So that is one of the uh, diagnostic criteria where you have, uh, you explain the intravascular hemolysis. And on the other hand, the, the complements activation will release some uh, uh, the other mediators like C3A and CP, C5A. So those are very competent uh, vasodilators. So they will act on the uh, uh, vaso, uh, vessel wall and they will release more uh, nitric, nitrous oxide and they will go, uh, end up with uh, hypotension. So why DIC in uh, acute hemolytic transfusion? Because of the ABO incompatibility. This is because of pro-inflammatory markers. So they will uh, go and act with the, uh, the pro-inflammatory markers and uh, activate the coagulation. And mainly what happens is TNF alpha and one uh, interleukin one will uh, expose these tissue factors. So that will uh, end up with 
uh, activating the extrinsic pathway, causing the increased coagulation. So you will end up with DIC. So fibrin deposition will be there, and the coagulation factors also will get uh, consumed, uh, consumed, and uh, resulting in bleeding. So why uh, renal uh, effects? So all together come into a play to uh, make the renal uh, failure. And what happens actually there is the hypertension and the uh, thrombosis is the main thing that will uh, uh, act on the uh, kidneys and causing failure. So they will end up with either a cortical infarctions or uh, renal fibular necrosis. So uh, this is actually important because uh, this is where we encounter with the uh, patients. So once uh, the, the blood is uh, going into a patient, if the patient complains about of these uh, 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 symptoms and signs, then of course you have to suspect an ABO incompatibility. So uh, main symptoms and signs are like uh, chills, uh, chest pain, headache, itching, palpitation, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, and but whatever it is, whatever the signs or symptoms that the patient complains, first thing that you have to uh, consider is the ABO incompatibility and in acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. Because at that point, if you stop the uh, transfusion, you can uh, minimize the effect to this patient. So uh, hypertension, hemoglobinuria, and bleeding are the main uh, manifestations, and those things will be detected. And uh, in depending on the patient, actually, you can uh, see different uh, manifestations of uh, uh, clinical features. So you have to be very alert on the transfusion reactions because the, the P clinical picture that they are showing is uh, different from one patient to another. So uh, mainly why ABO incompatibility is because of uh, misidentification of the patient, as I said previously. Why do you have to uh, uh, recognize it? Is it because uh, there will be another patient who is transfused uh, the wrong blood because of the misidentification. So uh, mostly uh, this is happened in emergencies and ICUs and ODs. So uh, as I said before, uh, different uh, patients will uh, come with uh, different manifestations. Especially these uh, the patients in coma or under GA, they don't they don't complain. So you have to be very alert on the, uh, the, the, the clinical signs that they are giving. So mainly uh, hemoglobinuria, hypertension, and uncontrolled bleeding. Sometimes uh, during a surgery, you might uh, think that this uh, bleeding is because of the surgical uh, bleeding, but it's not that so. It might be because of the DIC, because of the transfusion reaction. So investigating uh, these uh, uh, reactions, of course, I'll, I'll finish it uh, at uh, here itself because uh, before going to the next uh, uh, next uh, reaction uh, categories, uh, you have to uh, send the samples to uh, the blood bank uh, to investigate the transfusion reaction. So that is the pre-transfusion sample, of course, it's in the blood bank and the post-transfusion sample and the uh, blood bank if that is available. And uh, other than that, you have to uh, go for the hematological and biochemical investigation in order to confirm the hemolysis and to see the liver functions and the renal functions. So management, of course, I'll uh, explain here it, itself. So whatever the reaction is, you have to stop the transfusion uh, there itself. And then you have to maintain the IV line with that same cannula. Otherwise, you will end up with shock and you, don't, uh, you might not be able to find another cannula inserted. So uh, then you have to do the clinical check just to see whether there is an ABO incompatibility. Just because uh, you might uh, see uh, another patient is uh, going uh, with another wrong back. So, so that's, uh, you have to do it uh, as a priority. Then the monitoring. Monitoring, of course, you have to do the uh, vital monitoring, uh, pulse rate, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory, and very importantly, urine output. So uh, the other than that, of course, uh, you have to uh, very carefully give the, the support, uh, supportive care to these patients. And depending on the uh, clinical signs that the patient is giving, you have to uh, encounter then and there. So prevention is uh, better than uh, anything. So how do you prevent this uh, transfusion reaction, especially the ABO incompatibility? 
positive patient identification. What is positive patient identification? It's the, uh, so you have to go to the patient and you have to ask the identification details minimum two. So the patient has to tell by themselves. So if the patient is not able to uh, talk, then you have to go with the bystander or it's, uh, it's, you have to go with the documentation. So the sampling should be done uh, the big side and uh, good laboratory practice, of course, it's uh, towards the laboratory side. Right? And also co correct identification again uh, before the transfusion, that's again goes with the positive patient identification and the monitoring during and after the transfusions. So I'll discuss the uh, delayed hemolytic transfusion uh, reactions here itself. So uh, uh, when it's come to delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, uh, this is uh, because of the IgG uh, antibodies. So those will uh, activate the complement system up to a certain level, then it will happen with the extravascular hemolysis. And uh, the important thing here is you can't just uh, prevent it uh, suddenly, but what you can do is you can detect certain uh, clinical features like fever, uh, fatigability, worsening of anemia, and you can sometimes have hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinemia, shock, and renal failures also. So uh, you have to investigate uh, thoroughly just to see whether there is an antibody causing a hemolysis or something else. So uh, management, uh, again, you can't, uh, as I said, this is of course unpreventable most of the time. And uh, what you have to do is you have to, then afterwards you have to give an antibody part to the, uh, this uh, patient and after the identification, thereafter you have to go with the correct uh, blood uh, component and the these things. Peprine on hemolytic transfusion reactions uh, are just uh, just a few basically with some other uh, tachycardia and nausea vomiting with uh, some mild uh, 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 symptoms and signs. That is uh, because of the uh, regular transfusions and uh, because of the uh, uh, HLA antibodies and HLA antibody, uh, antibodies which are uh, present in the recipients because of the previous uh, exposures. And uh, there is another theory behind that, uh, that storage of uh, blood components like platelets will uh, release these uh, interleukin-1, 6, and uh, TNF alphas. These will uh, cause in this fever. So that is uh, mild. And uh, if uh, the ABO incompatibility and other causes are excluded, you can just go ahead with the transfusion. So prevention-wise, of course, uh, leukodepletion is the, uh, the preventive method and you have to be minimize the transfusion as uh, much as possible. So allergies and anaphylaxis, I'll just go through uh, very quickly here as the time limits. So uh, what happens here is the, uh, the, the, uh, the recipients are exposed uh, to these plasma products uh, very regularly and they produce uh, IgE antibodies which are attached to mast cells. And whenever these uh, antigens are exposed to these patients, they will uh, end up with uh, releasing these histamines and other uh, other components just to uh, appear these uh, reactions. So mainly histamine, leukotrienes, postagandines, uh, platelet activate factors, and triptase, they will uh, come and this is actually type 1 hypersensitivity, and they will go and uh, do the vasodilatation. So the symptoms mainly uh, comes with the hypotension. So if that comes with the hypotension with Urtic area, which is the pathognomic feature of the feature of the uh, allergy reaction, will end up with anaphylaxis. So, what is anaphylactoid reaction? Is that it is a IgE independent, but uh, whatever the mostly because of C3 and C5A, though those will uh, go and do the hypotension, uh, the vasodilatation, and result in hypotension with other features of anaphylaxis. So, it depends. Uh, Though it is uh, big, uh, different uh, uh, mechanisms, the, the ultimate results is the same. So that is called anaphylactoid reaction. Um, so I'll just quickly go through uh, these things. So management, of course, you need to know about this uh, uh, anaphylactic management. So uh, IV adrenaline, I, IM adrenaline is the uh, treatment of choice. Before the, uh, that, of course, you have to stop the transfusion and you have to be very careful with future transfusions. So transfusion-related acute lung injury, a few words about it, actually. So acute dyspnea, especially uh, the patients will come with dyspnea and bilateral uh, pulmonary infiltrates. The chest x-rays will be uh, having a white-out appearance, appearances. And also sometimes it comes with uh, hypotension, mild hypotension. 
So you have to uh, differentiate this within uh, transfusion associated cardiac overload and acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. So this will be, uh, uh, there will be few th uh, two theories actually. So one uh, theory is, uh, first theory is the, the HLA antibodies or HLA antibodies present in donor plasma will come and react with the patients, recipients, uh, neutrophils or leuco uh, leukocytes, which will cause in the, uh, the pulmonary, capillary, uh, pulmonary capillary leakages causing pulmonary edema. And also uh, sometimes uh, the, 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 the patients who have uh, already in, in critical conditions like sepsis, surgery, and other massive transfusions will, will be primed to up to this uh, condition. So this lipid and uh, certain other cytokines will come and uh, play the same role in the up with uh, trialing. So, uh, as I said before, you have to, uh, when you consider trali, of course, certain periods are there where you diagnose trali uh, uh, or diagnose, and certain times are uh, there where the trali is underestimated. So, uh, confirmation, of course, because uh, by the, uh, the X ray and the HLA compatibility testing. So, the donors will be positive for HLA and antibody. HLA and uh, HNA antibodies, whereas the recipient must be present with the same antigens just to confirm the diagnosis. So uh, transfusion associated cardiac overload, of course, you know about these things. So I'll just skip the slide. And post-transfusion uh, purpura is that uh, the especially the females uh, in, uh, come across with this uh, post-transfusion purpura, they will uh, exposed to a lot of uh, human uh, platelet antigens because of the pregnancies, multiple pregnancies. So they will produce uh, uh, HLA antibodies, HL, HPA antibodies against the platelets. So uh, once, uh, in, uh, once they are transfused late in life, uh, even the small number of uh, platelets will aggravate these, uh, activate these uh, human platelet antibodies and react, uh, result in severe thrombocytopenia. So uh, there is no uh, such a uh, uh, even uh, and they will present with severe bleeding also. Despite the bleeding, you don't transfuse uh, platelets because the, the bleeding will be severe. So you have to uh, select HPA uh, compatible platelets. Maybe you might uh, go into IBIGs as well. So uh, this is important uh, transfusion associated with graft versus hostages this is because of the, uh, the leukocyte engraftment of uh, host, uh, donor uh, leukocyte engraftment in the host, which we, who is uh, immunocompromised. So uh, irradiated products will be uh, the choice uh, to prevent this. So they will pr present with uh, uh, severe uh, uh, features like uh, fever, uh, maculopapular rash, and liver failure, pancytopenia, severe diarrhea, so there is no definitive treatment for this uh, transfusion associated graft uh, versus hostages. So only uh, thing is that you have to prevent it and you have to give the supportive care. So uh, I'll just skip these slides. Uh, so why we did this uh, transfusion reaction uh, lecture? Because just to support the previous lecture, just to prevent any transfusion reactions to uh, minimize the transfusion, so you can uh, uh, wisely choose the uh, transfusion in future. Thank you. Next, we move to the next presentation. Uh, it will be done by Dr. Manikara Sinhagay. She is a registrar in transfusion medicine at National Blood Center. She will be doing a case presentation on transfusion related adverse events. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be discussing two cases related to transfusion related adverse events. The first case is regarding 78 year old female who got admitted with abdominal distension for two days duration. On admission, she did not have any daily manifestations or any respiratory symptoms. 
Şimdi diagnoz ve işlemin kronik bir meselesiz, diabetes, hypertension, and ischemic kardis. Initial examination, uh, the vital parameters were normal initially. Her lungs were clear on admission. Initial investigations revealed the hemoglobin to be 8.4 gram per deciliter. The proton rate time was around 18 seconds with INR of 1.6. After initial symptomatic management, an average endoscopy was planned for this patient. Since her INR was 1.6, clinical team has decided to transduce her FNP for this patient. She did not, even though she did not have any real manifestations, they needed to correct INR prior to the procedure. So the patient, uh, the request was uh, made to the transmission medicine department, and the patient's blood group was O positive. And as for the request from the clinical team, three units of group OFFP were issued to this patient. And after about 20 minutes into the transmission, patient developed shortness of breath, fever with chills and rigors, and restlessness. And these are the details of the transmission. After about 100 milliliters of FFP transmission, the first time, the patient has developed the reaction. Initial baseline vital parameters are normal in this patient. But at the time of reaction, the pulse rate was around 112, blood pressure was 140 by 90, and there was mild increment in temperature as well. And the most important finding was the dropping of saturation. Initially, it was around 97%, but at the time of reaction, the saturation was 70%. Immediately, the FFP transfusion was discontinued, and the patient was given the respiratory support. Oxygen was given by our face mask. And uh, she received two doses of IV fluoxetine, but there was no improvement. And as with every each and every trans patient who developed transmission reaction, she also got IV flow for remain and IV hydrocortisone, the famous cocktail. But uh, there was no clinical improvement for any of these things, and patient's condition deteriorated. And then uh, she was incubated and ventilated. And then she was transferred to ICU for further management. Transmission team was informed regarding a possible transmission reaction. And these were the initial differential diagnosis came from uh, transmission medicine team. It could be either transmission associated circulatory overload, transmission related acute lung injury, or anaphylaxis. Uh, then post transmission investigations were performed to find out the possible uh, reason for this re reaction. Her chest X-ray reporting was done and it was revealed to me she was having bilateral pulmonary edema. Blood bank reaction workup did not reveal any abnormality. Uh, so this is the summary of what happened to this patient after the transfusion. The saturation has dropped uh, from 97% to 7% on air at the time of reaction. The bilateral lung examinations revealed coarse complications, but there is no elevation of JVP. And she had, did not respond to diuretic therapy. And her PA pressure was low, it was less than 200. And chest x ray revealed bilateral pulmonary edema. So, the most possible diagnosis uh, of CRALI has been made by the transfusion medicine team uh, by considering all the clinical presentation and investigation findings. Then we had to investigate for CRALI. Uh, for that, the donor details of the indicated FFP that were traced. And the donor was found to be a 43 year old female who had a history of three pregnancies, but she did not have history of blood and blood product transfusion. And then uh, we need to uh, confirm this by doing histocompatibility testing. For that, patients and donor samples were sent to HLA Reference Laboratory at National Blood Center for histocompatibility testing. This is the HLA typing of patient and donor. As you all can see, there, there are discrepancies between HLA typing uh, in patient and donor in almost all loci. The HLA antibody screening was performed using panel reactive antibody assays and single antigen beat assays. The recipient was found to be negative for both HLA class 1 and 2, whereas the donor was positive for both HLA class and class 1 and 2. Most important finding was the Donor was having recipient specific antibodies against uh, patients and HLA antigens. 
don't have antibodies against patient HLA A33, HLA C33, and HLA DQB1 C. So this is a very uh, significant finding related to trialing. And human neutrophil antibody has also performed, but it was negative. Uh, so these investigation findings confirm the diagnosis of anti-HLA mediated classic transfusion related adult language. And then what happened to the patient? The patient was given ICU care, but uh, even though she was mechanically ventilated, her pain condition deteriorated further, and unfortunately, the patient expired on ICU day five. The do since the donor was uh, identified to have recipient specific antibodies, she was permanently deferred from blood donation. Then let's move on to the second case. This is regarding 88 year old patient who. Uh, admitted with fever and cellulitis. Then later she developed sepsis and managed accordingly. And no respiratory symptoms were there at the time of admission. And she was a diagnosed patient with diabetes, hypertension, and ischemic heart disease. Initially, the vital parameters were normal and lungs were clear. Uh, Investigation findings revealed the hemoglobin to be 8.8 .8 gram per deciliter with platelet count of 32,000. And the patient was managed with IV antibiotics uh, for the clinical condition. And iron drop support was given initially, but later it discontinued with the clinical improvement. And then, uh, since the platelet count was around 32,000 and hemoglobin was around 8.8, .8, the clinical team has decided to transfuse her with platelets and red cells to correct platelet count and hemoglobin, even though she was not having bleeding or symptoms of anemia. And the request was sent to blood bank. Uh, blood bank investigations revealed the blood group to be group A positive, antibody screening was negative. So, group A positive, immediately cross match compatible, one unit of red cells were preserved for this patient. As well as group A positive, one and a therapeutic dose, dose of platelets were also preserved. Initially, the platelet transfusion was done without any significant delay. The next day, uh, red cell transfusion was requested and transfusion started. So, it's after 15, min 15 minutes into the red cell transfusion, patient developed shortness of breath, substance, substellar discomfort, restlessness, and wheezing. On examination, there were bilateral course complications on the lung fields and JVP was elevated. Uh, vital, param vital, uh, vital parameters prior to the transfusion were normal, and at the time of reaction, the blood pressure was very high. It was around 190 by 100. Pulse rate was around 140. She was tachycardic, and saturation has been dropped from 98% to 84% at the time of reaction. Immediately, the transfusion was discontinued and patient was given respiratory support. Oxygen was given by a face mask. And the uh, bedside faculty test ruled out uh, almost a uh, wrong blood incident. And then she also received IV clopidogrel and IV hydrocortisone. And she got two doses of IV trosimide, and there was mild improvement with IV trosimide doses. The transfusion team was informed regarding this. And the samples were sent to blood bank reaction workup. Blood bank reaction workup ruled out the possibility of ABO incompatible transfusion reaction. Then uh, her chest x rays, there were features of pulmonary edema and cardiomegaly. And there were all ischemic changes in her ECG. And ejection fraction of 25% was detected in her 2D echocardiogram. While considering all the clinical features and investigation findings, the possible diagnosis of transmission associated circulatory overload is made by the transmission medicine team. Uh, patient was given respiratory support. Initially, the uh, oxygen was given by a face mask, then later, the respiratory support was given by a CFAP. But the patient uh, recovered from acute episode and no further transmissions were indicated for this patient. Then uh, let's move on to the third presentation. Um, this is regarding a 17-year-old transfusion-dependent thalassemia patient who got admitted for routine blood transfusion. Pre-transmission hemoglobin was around 7.6. 
and according to her body weight, requests for 1000 milliliters of lymph reduced cell cells from natural blood and historical blood group was mentioned as group A positive, O positive, sorry, group O positive. And blood uh, bank pre transmission compatibility testing was done according to the protocols, and blood group was revealed to be O positive. It was compatible with the historical blood group. Antibody screening was negative. Then, four units of group O positive, I immediate screen transmission compatible, due to reduced red cells were selected and dissolved for this patient. First unit of red cell transmission was done without any complications. Then the second unit was issued from the blood bank, uh, and it transmission started within the 30 minutes uh, period from the point of issuing from the blood bank. And just after starting the transfusion, even with less than 10 milliliters of red cells being transfused, patient developed fever and she complained of back pain and irritability. The transfusion was discontinued immediately, and immediate bedside clerical test was done. And it was revealed that transfused blood bank was group B positive, even though the patient is group, group O positive. And this was a wrong blood incident. Immediately, the transfusion team was informed regarding this, and the patient was uh, monitored. And according to the instructions given by the consultant transfusion physician, uh, she was hydrated with IV normal cell and bolus, and what was informed to withhold all the other transfusions until the incident was investigated and at the same time all the blood issues from the blood bank were withheld to prevent another possible ABO incompatible transfusion. Then the patient samples and implicated unit were sent to blood bank for reaction workup. Uh, this patient has uh, at the time of reaction patient's pulse rate was around once 106, blood pressure was 150 by 90, and there's mild intimate temperature as well but saturation did not change. And um, this is the blood bank reaction workup. Both pre and post transmission samples were group O positive, and the indicated red cell that was group B positive. That was negative in both post and pre transmission samples. It can be positive, uh, it, uh, that can be negative as all the antibody coated red cells get demonized, then that becomes negative. Antibody screening was negative, and uh, both pre and post transmission samples were cross matched against. Implicated unit and both cross methods were incompatible. And this diagnosis was quite straightforward. This was acute hemolytic transfusion reaction due to ABO incompatibility. Uh, the, then the root cause analysis was done to find out the point of failure. This was found to be a bedside transfusion error. Wrong blood unit was given to the wrong patient due to incorrect procedure. Uh, initial patient identification was done correctly by the medical officer, but while connecting this blood pack to the patient, the medical officer has been distracted by a telephone call, causing procedure interruption. While, uh, as this was the this happened in a pregnancy thalassemia unit, there were several blood transmissions were happening at the same time. So uh, after returning from her telephone call, the blood pack, uh, the ward medical officer has uh, taken a wrong blood pack and connected, accidentally taken that wrong blood pack and connected this to this patient. And the patient, final patient identification and recommended double checking were not, has not been uh, done at that time. Uh, patient was admitted to ICU for further observation, but luckily patient is, was dis patient recovered without any complications. And since this was a thalassemia patient, she needed more blood transfusions. So, two units of group for positive cross functional caliber red cells were transfused uh, later without complications. And as this was a preventable uh, cause, uh, some uh, preventive measures were introduced after a review meeting held with the participation of all stakeholders, both clinical and laboratory team. Bedside transfusion practices were revised after that. Uh, some recommendations were given, like positive patient identification by two staff members and cross checking of each unit by two staff members separately. And, and uh, bedside clinical check to be done by a medical officer at the time of uh, connecting the blood pack to the patient. And then strict monitoring of the patient prior to the transfusion, during transfusion, and post transfusion period. And all the instructions were given as written instructions regarding this incident. 
And that's the end of uh, case three case presentations. Thank you.